a pretty fun and significant night tonight in the NBA. I really don't want to lose sight of the fact that in basketball tonight, drafted first is going to be the extremes of human evolution. Like the on the evolutionary chart, the thing at the end of it that is the most evolved is going to be picked first today among human beings who have evolved. Uh, so we'll get to that in a second. But Charlotte Wilder had her heart broken last night, and we've got other NBA draft things to talk to Amin about. Soon they will have a nebulous project up in the air that Metal Lark supports where they work together on these things. But Charlotte, what happened last night? Because I want to analyze Porzingis. Did anyone have this coming? Like Porzingis? We hear about all the trades, Porzingis to the Celtics, and then Marcus Smart uh, is going to be the veteran leader they need in Memphis, evidently. But, Charlotte, you've had your heart broken, correct? Because you like that Celtics team, and you like that he was the heart of and the soul and the gritty and the green hair of that Celtics team. Yeah, Marcus Smart was my favorite player on the Celtics team. I have loved what he's done for Boston, what he's meant for Boston. That's like the corniest thing you can say as a fan. But I was so sad last night. A friend texted me and said, I'm devastated about Marcus Smart. And it was like 12, 10 a.m. And I was like, what? And I panicked and I go to Twitter and I was like, oh, my God, no. And I felt I felt like someone had broken up with me. Like, I, you know, how you guys were giving me sh crap because I wasn't sad enough when they when the heat went up 3-0. I was like. Am I about to cry? Like, I, I'm so, I can't even, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. I can't, like, from a basketball standpoint, I don't know if it makes sense. I think it, I personally think it's sort of stupid, but, you know, I mean, you can tell us if that's true or not, but, like, from a, fan person standpoint i'm i'm in a bad place <laughs> the, the, right now i mean this is interesting because a human being who cares about the celtics and all the joy they've given loves how hard marcus smart tries but they just got better didn't they i'm just mad i can't say marcus smart anymore it's not marcus Smart. that's right dan charlotte is a human being and she does care about the boston celtics but uh, I don't know if they got better uh, in the sense that they got they got great return on value for Marcus Smart. I, I, I'll say that you trade him, you get two first round picks, which, geez, all right, and Kristaps Porzingis. That's awesome. But I think when you look at the Celtics, there's two things. One is what were they missing more than anything? Yes, they, size would help. You know, Robert Williams is injury prone. Al Horford is 800 years old. So, yes, having some size would have helped. Absolutely. But more than anything, they don't have a passer. They don't have someone who sets the table. They don't have someone who cares who's got it going, who needs to get it going. They don't have that guy on that team. Marcus Smart is not that guy, but he's pretty much the closest thing they had to that, and they just got rid of it for another guy who wants his shots and his touches and, and his opportunities. And so – there's that element of it. Like, you didn't get better. You got worse at the thing that you needed to get better at. But then the other part of it is, if I look at this Celtics team, and I say, who are the dogs on this team? Shout out to George Sedano. Give me some dogs. Who are the dogs? It's Marcus Smart and Grant Williams. Smart's gone, and Grant Williams looks like he's not coming back either. So you basically got rid of all the blue-collar, hardworking, dirt soul of the team. And added another guy who, again, wants shots and touches and all those things. And it's not a knock on Porzingis as a player. It's just a knock on the Celtics addressing fictional needs and ignoring real ones. Charlotte, for a moment here, I just want all of us to bask in how professional and wonderful your shot looks and how grainy and from the 1980s, uh, and a, a, maybe a Jacksonville a gas station with a curtain. Amin, a professional, an alleged professional here to give is analysis. Is a shutter behind him? It's unbelievable how he Amin's shot is. He stumbles in with bad lighting and not, you know, late – and Charlotte is here professionally to analyze the things that are happening, and everything around her looks so much sharper than what you've got going on. I mean, you look, your video looks jaundiced. It lo your video looks like it has a liver disease. Hey, Dan, remind us, one, remind us one more time that Charlotte's a human being. Uh, good chemistry. Good that chemistry. You will catch it on a nebulous future that the uh, Mean Show has with Charlotte Wilder. Charlotte, you've noticed how much better your shot is than his, yes? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know if you can call me professional when I come on here as a, quote, journalist and cry about Marcus Smart leaving. Like, let's... Uh... 
let's let's tamp it down. I don't want to be put on a pedestal here, Dan. Let's relax a little bit. That sounds like journalism to me. I'm not saying it was journalism. I'm just saying your shot looks crisp, and a mean a means looks like it has I, I, something communicable that it is contracted. I, I want everyone to know that I want to look like I came from heaven with light coming from behind me. God sent me to save this godforsaken show. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back and tell God, not happening. Charlotte. <laughs> Pick uh, another one. Charlotte, can you please, do you think your team has gotten any better? Can you fall in love with Porzengis because he's seven foot four and what he does is fairly ridiculous? I mean, yeah, if he's healthy, if he can do it, I don't know. I feel like what they need is someone who's going to go out there. I mean, Marcus Smart, I saw a stat that the Celtics were net positive over nine years when he was on the court. Like he, they, what does that even mean? He's such, you know, it means that when he's on the court, they're good, Chris. That's what it means. Nine and years? I think, <laughs> nine and I think sample. that like, I don't know, maybe it wasn't nine years. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm making everything up now, but I just feel like he was so the heart of a team that now as a mean said, I don't think it has one. I don't know who this team is anymore. Like you bring in Porzingis, you're sure he's tall, he's big, but what we need right now is someone who's <laughs> going to put that fire in them so that when they, I mean, good. He put cream. So that when they go down. He has put, uh, uh, forgive me, Charlotte, he has put cream on me. his shoulder. Are you, you know, there? While we're on this, while we're on this subject, forgive me for a second, Charlotte. Video team, can you please put together on the screen right now the AI that we were playing with, that we're combining, Eddie's, Eddie's, and I'll explain this to Charlotte and Amin in a second. But earlier Who's in the or earlier in the show, that I want to know which one is more offensive to you. I'll ask each of you the question, Charlotte. For one member of the shipping container, I will not tell you which one to refer to Freddie Mercury as Eddie Mercury. Is oh. is is that worse? Then another member of the shipping container in the first hour of our show referring to Penny Hardaway as Ann Freeney Hardaway. Ann Freeney Hardaway. Which one is worse there, Charlotte? I love her books. <laughs> I mean, Eddie is definitely closer to Freddie than than whatever the Hardaway was. I, well, I can't yes, even say what that uh, was. I mean, which one are you more offended by? I greatly enjoy the works of <laughs> Anne Freeney Hardaway, some of the best young adult horror books that I've ever read. Okay. A staple of my childhood. Uh, the video team has spent the entire break uh, merging famous Eddies with Freddie Mercury in order for AI to create an Eddie Mercury. I will say that Freddie, like, that's pretty bad. Freddie Mercury is, he's up there on my pantheon of people who matter. And I mean, if if you haven't, okay, that's wild. If you haven't seen the "I Want to Break Free" music video, go watch it right now. Is all I'm saying. Charlotte, I'm sorry this to do this. Is crazy. I'm sorry to do this. To you. Oh, Eddie Munster, come on! <laughs> I thought that was witty. I mean, <laughs> oh. <laughs> for those of you just listening on audio, uh, Amin has now put cream on the screen. We can't see him. He seems distorted. He seems like an FBI informant, and his voice has been modulated. But I just saw Whoopi Goldberg from the movie Eddie, the basketball movie Eddie, combined with Freddie Mercury to make Eddie Mercury. And uh, I heard, uh, Roy, help me out here, because I'm guessing Charlotte doesn't even knew, know the movie Eddie. Chris Cody said out loud to people, that Eddie was a good movie and uh, recommended it to Jeremy Tache. It's good. It's I mean, a slow burn. I mean, uh, I need to see what the cover, what the VHS cover looked like to jog some memories. Cinephobe had uh, reviewed that movie, by the way, Eddie. Uh, I, I believe it was a phobe. I mean, was it a phobe? We sure did. It was episode 107 of Cinephobe. Uh, Zach Harper filed it. Uh, Maze and I both hit it with the phobe. It's about a fan who gets made <laughs> into the head coach of the team because she was very critical of the head coach before. Also, there's a subplot where they want to sell the team and move it to St. Louis. So basically it was major league for basketball. But worse, way worse. Also, uh, Eddie Mercury, or as her mother calls her, Edwina Mercury. 
I think oh. it's important that the audio audience knows we're not putting a filter over. No, he's voice. really this good at him this. Really doing this, this. is it's amazing. It, I don't think we could do it as well with a filter. Um, but I mean, can you just give us your thought, like your most interesting thoughts about what we're headed into this evening? And should Charlotte feel very good about her team, given that? I thought the Brogdon injury kind of mattered. Uh, the Brogdon, all during the season, Brogdon was important for them, and their offense fell apart the moment that Brogdon's arm fell apart. Dan, I'm sorry. How can you say, should I feel good when I'm in a time of mourning? I've just been dumped. I don't feel good about anything. I'll talk to you about it next year. This is awful. Okay. Plenty of fish in the sea, Charlotte. Plenty of fish in the sea. But, uh... No, the original deal was a lot better for, I think, the Celtics. Even though I still don't think Porzingis uh, feels a need, I, I just think that, you know, keeping smart would have been a lot more advantageous than acquiring those two first round picks. Give me, you, give me 45 seconds uh, to end the segment on just things we need to watch for the draft tonight in that voice. Did you mute yourself? Did you mute yourself? Okay, excellent work as always. I mean, what? I Hello? Pre- Hello? <laughs> All right, you're on. Go ahead. <laughs> 30 I'm seconds. Trying to silence me. <laughs> I just want the Portland Trailblazers and Damian Lillard to have a certain amount of just. Re- All right, just the worst. He's just, just stop it. Uh, just stop it, Charlotte. I can't wait to see what nebulous projects you prefer you uh, produce with Amin El Hassan. That's the name of the show. Nebulous. Nebulous progress. Planet Nebulous. <laughs> See you guys later. Thank you for all your hard work. I mean, you're a useless <laughs> drunk. I'm an alien, and Charlotte's a human being. We've got a real hot streak going here. Brockmeyer has shown up at the appointed time, ready to... Give us content. It's not exactly the podcast I expected, but it is a weekly hit, semi-regular weekly hit, where we check in with our favorite sports broadcaster. He continues to drink too much, even though season four on Hulu, he was totally sober, and it was a happy ending. Now he's back on the sauce. Brock Meyer, thank you for being on with us again. A little early to be hitting the Sazerac. Never too early to hit the Sazerac. Grow up. And that's just part of the intro now. Just whining about it's not a podcast. And gee, you fell off the wagon. I'm like, worse than my mother. Ladies and gentlemen, can your hat just say worse than my mother on it? (laughs) My goodness. Okay, let's see. Video team, can you put up on the screen, please, something that makes it look like my hat says worse than your mother? Continue, Brock Meyer. (laughs) Yeah, it's very fitting. And there's plenty of room on your gigantic hat, too. It's like a billboard. Anyway, as you say, I am here and ready to talk baseball, baby. Late June, favorite time of the year. (laughs) It's when every other major sport is dead as a doornail, and the fans are just finally tired of poking at the corpses of them, (laughs) and our nation turns its lonely eyes back to the national past. No, no, no. We'll get to baseball in a second, but we got to talk first about- No, no, no. What? The the NBA draft is tonight. Oh, no. Yeah, Yeah, you're doing that to me? Yes. NBA? After that, love letter to baseball? What's the matter with- I mean, honestly- I'm, su- I'm supposed to be the baseball expert, right? That's why your, your beloved precious podcast, that's why you ha- want me to do it. And you're talking about the draft. We're talking about the draft, not a game, not <laughs> games that are being played, not a baseball game. We're talking about the NBA draft, not a game. Practice, <laughs> practicing for the future, not a game that I go out there and die for and call every game like it's my last, not the game that's being played of baseball. We're talking about the draft, the draft. How silly is, please, the draft. <laughs> yes, okay, the draft, you know what? Yeah, I'm on board. You know what? First, let me get drunk. It's a big night. It's the draft. It's the NBA draft. No, no, I want to talk. I do actually, all that said, I want to talk about it the draft because let let's call it what it is it's a televised employment fair okay <laughs> the climax of which amounts to reading a list of non alphabetical names into a microphone and by the way yeah boy this annoys me but he's always talking about how the draft is so inspiring it's so uplifting i don't find anything worthwhile about watching young men being forced 
to randomly live in a city that is not of their choosing. <laughs> What's good about that? The American dream is to, you work hard. This is the American dream. You're, you're in your awful hometown, right? You work very hard in hopes that someday, someday maybe, you might earn enough money to choose to live in a slightly less awful place, okay? But these young men, Dan, they're completely denied that choice. They get handed an adjustable hat instead, and then Adam Silver says to him, oh, well, I'm normally a tall man. You live in Orlando now. And exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which which NBA city do you imagine would be your least Oklahoma favorite city. to live? Oklahoma City. <laughs> I'm sorry to jump on you. I knew where you were going. That is the worst place in the world. It's just so obvious. No point in pretending to pause for reflection. You ever, you've been to OKC? Have you been there? Anyone? I have not. No, I've not. Okay, I drove through it one time and I kind of blacked out from boredom. Because you know what's nice occasionally? Like a hill or a freaking forest. The entire city is a flat, dry pancake of oil derricks and asphalt. And I'm, I'm sorry, Jesus. people of Oklahoma City. No, I'm yes, sorry. Come on. I feel bad, OKC people, if you're just driving to work now or doing the dishes or whatever boring thing you're doing. And all of a sudden you just got caught and you caught this stray. But you got to understand. I mean, please. I mean, you do live in Oklahoma City. You get it, right? <laughs> I mean, you live there. You only, well, come on. I, maybe they're thinking, hey, I know what they're thinking in OKC right now. What about Sacramento? That's horrible. <laughs> True. But Sacramento is at least in California, which is an hour's drive or an hour's flight from some of the greatest cities in the world. OKC is only impressive in contrast to the rest of Oklahoma. That's like living upwind from an outhouse. It's the only, it's the only best option if you're forced to live near piles. So. Okay, all right, enough of that. Don't do that to the But poor... young men are being sent there we against have, their will. We have will. listeners Dang, there. We have listeners. Do you have any predictions about Victor Wembanyama? Uh, Mike Ryan is out. He's got his doubts about Wembanyama. This might be a tricky name for you to say, drinking. It's a tricky name for me to say, Wemben not Yama, drinking. Wembanyama, 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 Wembanyama. No, I heard, I can't believe Mike's not there. I was ready to tear him a new one about that. I heard him the other day that Victor, I'm going to quote Mike. Mike quote Mike said he's not good. That's how he assessed Victor Wembanyama. Uh, over the top, contrary to objective reality, that the rest of us share. I mean, I'm worried about him that he's gotten Bayless pilled. You know, <laughs> and Mike, Mike, if you're listening to this, excuse me. Oh come on! Oh my good. Come on, well, be a come professional. On. You know, I am. I just need the lubrication, and sometimes it comes back at me. Um, Mike. If you're listening, you're too young to go full skip Bayless, okay? Because this is how it starts. You start out with a few wild takes that seem like fun, and then 20 years go by in a flash, and suddenly you're a slab of beef jerky with unnaturally white teeth snarling about LeBron James. I mean, because <laughs> let's be honest, Mike is halfway there now. So yeah, yeah. I think it's safe to say that I disagree with him on that one. Yeah. Women Yama is not overrated. Because here's a fun stat. I heard a lot of the stats he was spouting. Here's a counter stat to all that. And I am well known for my knowledge of analytics. And this one just stood out to me. He's seven foot five. Okay. <laughs> His fingers are 12 inches long. Did you see the pic? You see? Yeah, there it is. Look at him holding a baseball in his hand. It's, it's like a Mentos in his hand. I mean, if the guy ever took a dick pic, he'd have to have somebody else hold his Johnson just to give it the Come proper on. scale. Come on. What? Come the guy on. can go rim and the three-point line at the same time he doesn't need to move yeah that's the whole game these days three-pointers and layups on day one of his nba career mike ryan this kid will be the single best player at disrupting both layups and threes and here's my prediction dan in his rookie season when Benyamo will get at least one triple double with 10 blocks or more Okay, can the good people at DraftKings help us out with that friendly wager? I'd mm -hmm. like to bet Mike Ryan personally on that. Nobody's doing it with blocks in, in, except Hassan Whiteside in the Puerto Rican. Little league. Pirata stand up. Yes, he is. Uh, thoughts on Zion Williamson, please. He uh, he might leave the Pelicans, and he's embroiled in that whole sex scandal thing. I mean, I feel very bad for this young man, Dan, because I know what that is like for your dirty laundry to be out in the street. You do, yeah. And to be, I really do. And to be judged and kink shamed. I mean, for consens consensual. Wait, I gotta take a sip when I mess up. Yeah, that's right. Consensual. Wembenyama. Consensual. Was fine. I did well with Wembenyama. I, I stumbled on consensual. But these are consensual sex acts with a very attractive, 
and very unstable uh, women. I mean, th- I know that story all too well. So from one horny, mistake-prone man to another, Zion, I am rooting for you, my my fellow disgusting brother. And, and frankly, I'm pretty shocked that the public is so fascinated by such vanilla details about the young man's sex life. I mean, come on. Vanilla? Vanilla? Yeah. I, I mean, un- unseemly uh, vanilla? Okay, not vanilla for squares like you, Dan Levitard, but some of us have actually lived, okay? Some of us have plumbed the depths of our sexuality like poorly made submersibles at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, come so, on. I mean, come well, on. no, you come on. Spitting in somebody's mouth. I mean, a woman does that to me. That's barely foreplay. If anything, that's like a friendly hello. That's just the intro business to get out of the way before the real adventure can begin. Spitting in somebody's <laughs> mouth. Who cares? If you're going to cast aspersions on Zion, I think it could be argued that he does have some impulse control issues. Like, you know, similar to John Morant, only instead of flashing guns on the internet, Zion's issue sounds like a classic case of... Uh, of DoorDash and Smash. I don't That's know. I don't know what that. I don't know what that term is. What I'm unfamiliar. Oh, I, well, oh I'm so excited! I know a, a term that the kids invented and somebody else doesn't. The kids came up with that. That's where DoorDash and Smash is where you order large amounts of fast food, and then you time the delivery so that the meal arrives right directly after the completion of all sexual activities. So please try it with your good lady wife, Dan Levitard, because you haven't lived. Until you're eating lemon pepper wings in the bed that you've just soiled with bodily juices. And oh, I mean no. mere seconds no, before. Oh no. Yes, whiny girl. <laughs> and I would not, I wouldn't argue that DoorDash and Smash is a recipe for the healthiest mind and body. And let's face it, that's that's the real issue with Zion, is his body. I mean, it's a one-of-a-kind athleticism trapped in a frame that so obviously just wants to chunk out and become riddled with gout. Oh, come on. I mean, there's a, well, really, there's a war brewing inside him between the athlete that he is and the fat guy that his body clearly yearns to be. And I still believe in him. I believe in Zion. On the court, he's got that dog in him. Problem is that off the court, that dog is always just so hungry. Like, yeah, don't, uh, like don't, eating a, don't, <laughs> eating, don't what? Don't fat shame him. I'm not, I'm just stating facts here. I mean, he's obviously got, uh, uh, like a, eating a pack of uncooked hot dog. I can't even say it. He's hungry, hungry man. He's got to take it easy. He's got to tame that dog. And no matter what his sex life is, he's not going to live up to his vast potential if he doesn't. And, you, know, I, you know, I'm getting a little distracted. I'm sorry I messed up that last bit. But well, but I don't understand what you were saying about uncooked hot dogs. I'm saying that there's he's got a genuine dog on the court off the court, that dog is very hungry, like eating a pack of uncooked hot dogs straight from the fridge kind of hungry, okay? okay? okay. There it is. Okay, that is now, very hungry, yes. What's distracting me is the absence of uh, of Stugatz. Uh, I haven't once heard the nicotine-soaked death rattle that is his <laughs> laugh, and I assume that he, of all people, would be into the weird sex that I was just talking about. Where's Stugatz? He's on vacation again. He's following Dead & Company around... Oh, get out of here. He is. He's following the... That's where he is? Yes. Okay, no, no fair. I call no fair. Nobody told me... You can use vacation time to get paid to do drugs? Okay, well, I'm, I'm a sucker because this whole time <laughs> I've been doing drugs and still showing up to work. I didn't know there was another option here. <laughs> are you on drugs right now? Are you high at this moment? Is that why you botched your uncooked hot dogs thing? Got my usual Sazerac, and uh, no, I am not on drugs. Well, yes, I'm on a little bit of drug. I'm, you know what I'm doing? I'm microdosing uh, about a quarter ounce of mushrooms right now. That's not microdosing. <laughs> well, they, they, my drug tolerance is very big. It's as big as Victor Wembanyama's fingers. <laughs> so for me, a gallon-sized Ziploc pack of magic mushrooms—that's micro. And I'm fine, by the way. Look, I can, I can touch the, I can do the. The thing, you know, the the roadside test. I'm totally good. I mean, you are moving around the frame a little bit, Dan. But honestly, it's kind of nice to see. At least you're getting some exercise in my hallucinations. It's very nice. Come on, you're gonna fat shame me too? Well, somebody better. I mean, you, the yes man over there ain't gonna do it. I know. I'm just. You look great, Dan. There you go. You look fantastic. Anyway, I I, I hope Stugatz has fun. I totally understand why he had to drop all of his responsibilities and fly up to New York and Boston 
to hear a couple of 80 year old men jam out on stage. Cause as everybody knows, if there's one thing that improves with age, boy, is it ever improvisational guitar solo? No, That's I, some I, fun I stuff. think John Mayer now plays with them. He's the youth of the, of the troupe. John Mayer's the, the new blood, huh? Well, I take it all back. My goodness. John Mayer. Playing with the last few living members of the Grateful Dead. Oh, I retract my sarcasm, man. Because everybody knows, boy, sprinkle a little John Mayer on anything. That'll enhance the experience of watching elderly people do things that they used to be good at. Jeez. <laughs> Maybe Stu Gatz and I can split another bag of shrooms and watch uh, 94-year-old Bob Cousy and John Mayer play a little one-on-one. -on -one. About as fun as watching frail, near-death men struggle through Uncle John's band. All right, okay? let's let's talk baseball now. I'm done with Uncle your... John I'm... Mayer joins the dead. My I, goodness. I am Ooh, done with I, your I, music I... opinions. Let's talk baseball, please, please. Finally. Great. I, I, that's why Ryan and Stugatz took off, right? Because they knew we had to talk baseball today, so they bugged out. My goodness. I get to finally... Talk about literally the only sport being played right now in America on this, what is a sports podcast? Thanks for allowing me the privilege. Meh. Yeah, well, sort of. Well said. Sort of. Well said. Sort no, no. Well, I can't argue with me. Can't <laughs> argue with that. Man, you're good. You are good, Dan Levertari. <laughs> I do. I understand. I get it. It's it's a it's a an opinion that is shared by many folks, especially young folks, about why baseball is no longer a national sport. I have a theory on it. I think it's because baseball is every day, which means there's no pause in the action, which means there is nothing for the sports media industrial complex to talk and dissect and argue about. So instead of all that hot air, there's always another actual game to play and to watch. See, baseball is the Steven Soderbergh of sports, Dan. So <laughs> prolific for so long, it becomes hard to appreciate it. There's just too much of it to take in. But I would argue that's also what makes baseball so very special, that it is every day. It, 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 it's constant, especially now, in a time when everything seems to be in flux, doesn't it? Everything just seems broken. So many things seem to be changing for the worse, that's like so, off the top of my head, so out true. of thin air. Right. Yeah. Like two examples. That, gee. Oh, hey. How about the fact that our global climate is irrevocably. F and that fascism is on the rise. And I mean, all over the world or more locally, the fact that in your state of Florida, they are banning the public discussion of black history from public schools. I mean, kudos over there. Scary, scary stuff. Kind of news that can cause any rational person to just spin out and doom spiral or. Instead, you can take a nice deep breath and know that there's a baseball game on today, just like there was a baseball game on yesterday and every spring and every summer day since the Civil War. <laughs> Only American institution that's still functioning since then, Dan. And I encourage everyone <laughs> to grab onto it like a railing as our democracy and our environment yeah. just fall down the stairs like elderly guitar players of Stugatz's favorite band. All right, Brock Meyer. It was good seeing you again. Always a pleasure. Good having you back. Stay out of the drink, please. Uh, start drinking a little later in the day. Good talking to you, Brock Meyer. I love you, Dan. I'm in love with you. There, I said it. Okay, that was unnecessary. I appreciate your time, though. Uh, your love, uh, thank you for that as well. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you. Otherwise, I'm just dead inside, except for my feelings for you. My apologies to the audience here. We have wandered away in the speed of the last hour where a drunken Brock Meyer intervenes on the show next to an explorer who tells us what it's like to go to the most uninhabitable places on Earth. I mean, in Charlotte, I mean, in Charlotte, this well, this was both funny and disappointing to me that on a pretty big night in sports, people do enjoy no matter how much Brock Meyer makes fun of it. The absurdity of the NBA draft. We went to a mean our basketball expert, and all we learned is that he's good at doing a modulated voice. It was wild. Glad we learned it, though, because that was amazing. Right, but we didn't learn anything about the draft. We didn't get smarter as an entity. He told you some stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's much better than Chris Cody's uh, awful, distorted voice Take person. the swing, baby. Uh, no, I wish you hadn't. Regardless, that's all I learned from Amin in the doing of what 
was ostensibly our basketball coverage. But the place that I failed and the place that I need to apologize to the audience for is slowly over the course of this show, I have got further and further somehow away from Boogie in Your Butt. And uh, Roy, earlier in the show, alleged that Eddie Murphy had a hit song in the 80s and the hit song that he mentioned was not Party All the Time, the one he did with and around Rick James. That was, I think that was a certifiable number one song in America. And that's the hit that I think of when I think of Eddie Murphy. Did it ever get to number one or it never got to number one? Party All the Time, highest ranking was two. Uh, All U.S. All right. Silver medal. That's kind of like one, though. Yeah, almost. If you there. make it it's to two, two, it's a one. It's close. Yeah. Well, you say that, but the Heat were two, and I said that was good enough as a season, and everyone said I'm a loser. It is good enough for me. I just want that stated. <laughs> it went platinum. Put it on the poll, please. Would you be totally fine if your number two song in the world never got to number one? And you just had to settle for number two, you loser. Where in life is second place best? That's just putting that out there for people to think about. We can come back to it when we have second, A firing squad. Death is good. <laughs> Firing squad all see? Same same category. Regardless, <laughs> Roy said it's Boogie in the Butt is the name of the song. Boogie in your butt. Boogie in your butt. Yes. And how high did that get on the charts? Because I've never even heard of the song. On the R and B chart, it went fifty six. Okay, but the R and B chart is not the overall chart. I think you just chose a number that better suits your argument I because did. It's like us being first in sports, but like 98th overall. I'll give you this, though. Was <laughs> nominated for the Grammy Award for Best R&B Instrumental Performance. So, you know, not the vocal, but still something. Good beat. Not the part that Eddie Murphy did. No. <laughs> Correct. You just fraudulently tried to bolster your argument by going... What, uh, give me some of the songs before this on the R&B chart. Are there any bangers on there? Or once you get to 56 on the R&B chart any given week, are you really slogging through just what was released that week in music? Well, I would have to look for the year. They only, I only look for the songs. So I'll well, but you were that. cheating. You were trying to bolster your argument. Uh, Jeremy, can you give me some of the lyrics to the illustrious hit that Roy... This yes, could be I can. Uh, get me the lyrics, please, to Boogie in Your Butt. I want to know what this song is about. So I will say, uh, prefacing this, some of it, not surprisingly, a bit outdated. <laughs> okay, well, we're, we are now at the risk of getting canceled. Uh, understand that this was a song from a long time ago, and I have not edited it. But the starting point is, the song's name is Boogie in Your Butt. Yeah. You're good. That's right. Thank, well, here, hold on a second. Maybe this covers that. <laughs> Time to throw away all journalistic credibility and get reckless. Here is something we like to call reckless speculation. You're good? Sure. In your butt. Put the biggie put the boogie in your butt. Put Wait put the boogie put, in your put, butt. Wait a minute. Put the biggie in your butt is totally different song. Well, different we're getting song. there. We're getting there. Way different song. And a movie. I ain't putting no boogie in nobody's butt. That's nasty, man. What you talking about? Putting boogie in people's butt. Are you out of your mind or something? Could go to jail for doing something like that. Still true in nine states. Wait a minute. Do you think this would be any better if Roy were doing it? No. Are you, are you up no. the... Are you up... No, let's try this. It I'm doing be, my no, best. No, 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 slightly. Know, Jer- I think it'd be a slightly better. Jer- Jeremy, no, I think it's pretty bad lyrics. Jeremy, you want to hand it over. Let's call for a reliever like Roy does in the bedroom when he needs a complete game billy. Hey, yo. Oh, okay. Complete game billy. Let's go and... Not denying it. Let's, uh... <laughs> Are we sure that we want to do this? No. <laughs> okay. I can keep going. No. Uh, oh, God, please no. Uh, how about how about one of you, let's see who does this better. Roy, go ahead and you do it, please. In your butt, put the boogie in your butt. Put, put the boogie in your butt. In your butt, put the boogie in your butt. Put, put the boogie in your butt. I ain't putting no boogie in nobody's butt. That's nasty, man. What are you talking about? Putting a boogie in people's butts? <laughs> are you on your mind or something? Could go to jail for doing something like that. Well, step aside, my friend. I've been doing it for years. I say, sit on down, open your eyes, and open your ears. <laughs> say, put a tree in your butt. Put, put a bumblebee in your butt. What? what? Put a clock in your butt. What? Put a big rock in your butt. What? Say, put some fleas in your butt. Say what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, not much better. No, not much better. Worse somehow. <laughs> say, start the sneeze in your butt. Say, put a tin can in your butt. Whoa. <laughs> 
Put a tiny little man in your butt. Hey. Say, put a light in your butt. Say, make it bright in your butt. <laughs> Say, put a TV in your butt. Now we got it. Say, put me in your butt. Everybody's saying, I'm not doing it. Oh, uh, now you did not. it, though. You no, did it. You did it. You did it. No, Congratulations. Yeah, no, yeah. You, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Roy. Yes. Before the show today, what I told Chris Cody, uh-huh. I, I said, Chris Cody, this feels like the 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 eleven win Heat roster that I was working with today. Fifteen win. Yeah, you corrected me last time on this. Yes, a fifteen win Heat roster uh, that Anne Fernaway, Anne Fernie. I think we're getting farther away from what the truth was there, Dan. I think I said Anne Fernie. Absolutely not. <laughs> You said Anne Freeney. Anne Freeney. Anne Freeney, yes. Okay. You said Anne Freeney, and I mentioned earlier in the show that this roster construction was not good enough to play an NBA game with. And Roy said, just throw me the ball. I've got it in the post. Just throw it to me. I'll give you 40 points. And look at what you just gave me when I asked you to read some lyrics. You, you fell apart. You, you couldn't do it. You did it worse than Jeremy, who was doing it plenty bad for all of us. Would you like to hear the second verse, Dan? Uh, right. Sure. Well, step aside, my friend, and let me show you how to do it. When big, bad E just rock, rock to it. Put a case in your butt. Say, put a metal case in your butt. Put her face in your butt. I can't fit anything else in my butt. Put a frown in your butt. Put a clown in your butt. Say, sit on down in your butt. Say, put a boat in your butt. Say, put a moat in your butt. Put a mink coat in your butt. Put everything in your butt. Just start to sing about your butt. Feels really good when you sing about your butt. That's verse two. Not only did you call for the ball, bad enough that you would say, I got us. I got us as a show. You said that was a hit song. You, Roy Bellamy, said that at some point in America, people listened to those lyrics and were like, that's a song that I want to dance to, putting everything in the world in my butt. 56 on the R&B charts. What else is in front of it? I can't find it. No, of course. That year, Sexual Healing won the uh, instrumental R&B award over Boogie in Your Butt. I feel like in in this starting five, I'm Shane Battier. I'm a guy everyone's happy is on the team, is happy is here, but he's not really doing anything to really help you win the game. <laughs> like, he's just going to do a lot of things that people are tippy-toe three, take a charge. Wrong guy. We're still going to lose. Is, isn't he tippy-toe three guy? No, tippy-toe three is Antoine Walker. Oh. I feel like he had a little tippy-toe. If, if we were doing a top three tippy-toe three-point shooter in Heat history, Antoine Walker number one, Shane Battier number two. Okay. Yeah, I believe three. you just confused Shane Battier and Antoine no, Walker. No, 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 no. Antoine Walker did more to help the team win than Shane Battier. Yeah, you're, like Shimian. To, you're Tony Snell. You're not on this Holy Heat team. Moly. You're not You're not on this Heat team. You're just generally someone in the NBA who will give you a good team guy, but will give you a lot of 27 minutes, zeros across the board. But everyone likes him. Everyone likes to play with everyone him. Everyone likes Tony Snell. And he's DeAndre made- Jordan. That's who Chris is. Best friend. That's offensive. Best friend, hanging out, being there, doing absolutely champion. This is a nothing, game, but a champion. What NBA player is Chris Cody? DeAndre Jordan, champion friend. I'm. I can no. I my my shots a little better than his. I don't know. I'm more versatile than you. Want to look at the career earnings of DeAndre oh, Jordan? Money wise, I mean, yeah. well, I I am overpaid for sure. It's <laughs> all a compliment. <laughs> DeAndre Jordan's game is limited. But he's a good friend, and every once in a while, he'll lure you, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, and they'll destroy your entire city. I feel like we can do better. I'm not accepting this one. I'd rather be Shane Battier, team guy. I want to ask you guys, as we see this medium totally changing, dying in some places, how it is that you felt about the news that ESPN Radio which was a juggernaut of influencing how some people consume sports, just got rid of their morning show of Max Kellerman, Jay Williams, and Keyshawn Johnson because all of ESPN Radio has sunk into the earth and there's not really a reason to listen to what they're doing there because they've kind of just given up 
on what has been a dying medium for a long time has not yet died, right? Because there's still plenty of money in radio, plenty of familiarity, plenty of people who have listened for a long time that will continue to listen. But there is no reason to listen to ESPN radio for anything that used to be personalities, whether it was Mike and Mike that you got there or Scott Van Pelt and Russillo or whoever it is that brought you up in ESPN. Tony Kornheiser a million years ago. ESPN radio used to be a destination. I, I legitimately, as someone birthed by that, don't have any idea what is even in their lineup. I could not name one show in their lineup. I don't. Everyone was saying, like, criticizing ESPN for this. For me, if you're a big thing like ESPN like why just keep making shows till you get it right till you stumble into a Mike and Mike I'm with you it doesn't seem like there's a big plan there it doesn't it doesn't seem like there's a lot of it's disrespectful to say there's not a lot of thought that goes into it because I'm sure there is but it's just not I'm not but I'm just I'm not I'm not sure that a lot of thought is going into whatever they're doing there's very little proof of it I listen I've listened to that show numerous times and it's not that great so I don't I'm, but I no, I don't think a lot of thought is going into the uh, craftsmanship required to do this well. I think they're just putting people at microphones. I feel like the only constant in the ESPN's lineup is Freddie Coleman, the goat. Why did that make you laugh, Chris Cody? Just it, it's, it's, it's he's right. You. He's been there forever. It just yeah. you. 